you can criticize me because I'm used to it. <laughs> okay, well, good morning. This is Pushing Boundaries, a podcast about pioneering research, breakthrough discoveries, and unconventional ideas. I'm your host, Dr. Thomas R. Verney. My guest today, I'm pleased, very pleased to announce, is Dr. Bruce Lipton, cellular biologist and author of The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter, and Miracles. And that was published in 2008, I believe, Bruce? 2005. 2005. Okay, so I have got a later copy then. Of, oh, yeah, yeah. Probably the paperback, right. Okay. It's still, it, same book is still selling. So um, I, I'm very gratified that uh, it was fundamental information to today's world. Yeah, yeah. I, I have had the same experience with The Secret Life of the Unborn Child, which was published in 2002, I think, uh, and uh, still selling all over the world. Amazing. Um, well, you're a, pi a pioneer, my young friend, because you and I met at uh, an APA meeting uh, yes. years ago, and it profoundly influenced my life because then I got moved into uh, uh, development and pre- and perinatal work, and that led to psychology and all kinds of wonderful things. So uh, I want to thank you because you pulled me out of the old Stanford world and put me into a new burgeoning world. As you just said, uh, your book uh, was foundational for all of this stuff. And I'll just put a little side note. It was at that time that I met you that I also met my future wife, Margaret. Right. And you might even remember we were standing in the row of seats and we were yes. talking and all of a sudden a woman walked by us and went, <gasps> and was holding her chest like that, and that was Margaret. And that was it, and that has continued uh, your love affair with Margaret, right? Uh, so wonderful, because I never believed in love, and I was nearly 50 at that point, so I had a lot to learn, and, uh, uh, and the beautiful part of it, a guy who never believed in love writes a book called The Honeymoon Effect. So mm -hmm. uh, at some point, uh, yeah, I learned a lot by being in love. Love was the whole secret sauce that uh, I didn't really have most of my life because I didn't understand it, and I didn't understand my perinatal, prenatal programming that I got from my parents, which restricted me from experiencing that thing called love. So, well, then going along with that, you also wrote another book, uh, your last one, I believe, which is called Spontaneous Evolution, a positive yes. future. Okay, so we're, we're... Which, of, which of those three books do you feel sort of most excited about? Well, of course, the, the biology of belief was the, the equivalent of your pioneering mm -hmm. work. It was mm -hmm. my pioneering work in the field yeah. of epigenetics, which was right. real exciting. But the story that, be, that really fulfills me the most is yeah. spontaneous evolution, because it explains uh, from a biological perspective, the nature of human evolution. So while well, people talk about our society based on oh, economic society, uh, psychology, uh, uh, politics and all that, I say, no, we are a biological entity experiencing something that was so much deeper than all those other things right there. And if you understand the biology, we are forced into a situation that either we evolved now or enjoy the remaining days that are left on this planet because humans have precipitated their own extinction. Yes. <laughs> and this is a wake up call. Either we do something to save ourselves or enjoy the remaining days. <laughs> right, right. So going back to your first uh, foundational book, um, the, uh, the Biology of Belief, um, what is it that you want readers to sort of learn from that book? What, what are some of the sort of leading themes of that book? Well, the, the, let's uh, look at one of the major things, because, yep. you know, you're involved with programming and development and all that, that we all grew up in a world based on the belief that uh, genes control the character of our lives. And I right. go, and I'm, I was teaching this in a medical school. And of course, you teach along with this the fact, well, as far as you know, you didn't pick the genes. And if you don't like the characteristics, you can't change the genes. And then we tell everybody genes turn on and genes turn off by themselves. And I say the conclusion we have programmed the public to believe 
is that genes control their life and they're victims of their heredity. Whatever right. is running in their family, they say, oh, I got the genes for that and I'm gonna manifest. I go, this is a really very terrible thought. <laughs> uh, and the book really reveals something different. It says that consciousness is what controls our genetic activity. And all of a sudden it says, well, this is the whole powerful reason for, for your work, Thomas, is exactly the nature of what, what consciousness are we programming into the public? And I go, well, with the genetic determinism belief, genes control your life, we, we program victim. Oh, I can't handle it. It's my genes did this to me. And I, don't, I can't do anything with my genes. And then we look for a rescuer. And then a pharmaceutical company pops up and says, here we are. <laughs> and I go, okay, what's wrong with that? I said, the whole thing is wrong <laughs> because genes are not in, in a technical term, self-emergent, mm -hmm. which means genes are not turning themselves on and off. Mm -hmm. Genes are blueprints to make the body parts. That's a fact. But then I said, well, go into an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint and then just say, hey, is your blueprint on or off? And she would look at it, wait, you're crazy. It's a blueprint. There's no on and off. I go, precisely. Genes are blueprints. The mind is the architect. And the architect can call up the genes. And number two, architects can modify the readout of the blueprints. And all of a sudden it says, oh my God, architects are consciousness. And I go, yes. And I said, why is it important? Because you're not a victim of your genes. You unconsciously, uh, you're unaware of the fact that your mind is controlling the genes and therefore you're the one that can change your mind. And all of a sudden I say, well, oh my God, we go from victim, the belief of genes controlling us to master when we understand the concept of epigenetics uh, which reads simply epi means above. So when I, when I talk about skin, I call it epidermis because just underneath the skin is a layer called dermis. So epidermis means above the dermis. Epigenetics means above the genes. And now we know what you've been teaching the public about for years uh, is the concept of this programming <laughs> that goes on in this mind is what ultimately controls the genes. Uh, just a you know shock story right now, there's not one gene that causes cancer. There's everyone thinks, oh, genes are causing cancer. There's not one gene that causes cancer. Genes are correlated with cancer, but they themselves do not engage the cancer. It's a life out of harmony. It's a life uh, with suppressed anger. It's a life where people are not living what they really want to experience or holding things inside and that heat from holding that stuff inside is what initiates a cancer. So it's really important because so many women believe that the uh, BRCA breast cancer gene is causing cancer. And then they go to a doctor and they get diagnosed with a gene and they go, oh my God, I'm going to get cancer. And I go, what's the thinking? And the thinking is a picture of cancer. I go, well, that's what's going to manifest. You manifest the picture that your consciousness is. Uh, and so I say, most important point, only 50% of the women, 50% of the women that have the breast cancer gene never get cancer. And I go, so what's relevance? Possession of the gene doesn't mean you get cancer. It's not living in harmony. And you want to know about not living in harmony, then I would direct everybody to your book, Thomas, because that's where it all started. So you are no friend of the pharmaceutical companies, obviously. Oh, geez, no. <laughs> you know what, people? I just want, I want people to understand this. It's a simple fact. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the, the very, it's a very simple fact. It's, it's a fact of science. If a drug works for you in your body, that means the chemistry of that drug is matching what is called a receptor on a cell that responds to the drug. A receptor needs to re read the drug and then engage the cell. So the first thing is this. Well, if you have a receptor for a drug, God didn't give you that receptor waiting for the pharmaceutical company to make the drug. If you already have a receptor, it's because you already can make that drug. You don't have a receptor for things you can't make. So any drug that works, works because we naturally must have a, a, a correlation of natural uh, signals that are in the body. Now you say, well, why should I take the drug? And I said, because why are you not releasing the natural signal? Now we return right back to your work because then what was the programming about the vision of life? Because people get programmed. The picture is a, a program is a picture where 
my life. And then the simple point is the brain translates the picture into chemistry that complements the picture. A picture of love in the brain releases wonderful chemistry, dopamine for pleasure, oxytocin for bonding, growth hormone, which of course, why when people fall in love, they're so healthy because love releases that chemistry. But I say, if you have a picture of fear, you don't release love chemistry in the blood, you release fear chemistry, which is completely the opposite because it shuts down the growth and gets you in a closed protection thing. And I go, well, that's different chemistry. So the point that connects our work profoundly, Thomas, is my study reveals that the picture you hold in your mind, and this is in the subconscious mind, the programmed mind that Thomas <laughs> you know, describe to the world, the program mind, uh, the picture in that is translated by the brain into complementary chemistry. So whatever the picture is, healthy picture, I got healthy chemistry. Uh, fear picture, I got chemistry that will shut me right down. Uh, and all of a sudden it says, well, then understanding your life is this. 95% of your life is not coming from wishes and desires and the things you want. 95 is a percent of your life is a direct readout of the subconscious programs. And I say, where'd you get those subconscious programs? I say, oh, Thomas, how about telling us where we got those subconscious programs? Because that's his field. And that's when we got connected because I remember that meeting because uh, Thomas's field, everybody understood pre-impairing natal influences shape the fate and development of the child. And I came in in that year, and I don't know how many, well, it's 25 or 26 years ago, I came in there and explained a new science that science hadn't even told them about called epigenetics, where all of a sudden I said, the mind is manifesting this body. And the whole place just got all excited because Thomas introduced the knowledge of mind influencing it. And I came in and just showed the mechanics of how that mind affected that DNA. And that completed a picture, mm -hmm. which is one of the most relevant stories in this world today. And I know you're there, so hold your ears because I want to tell people about this. One of the most important determination factors that influence our future is the fate of our children. That if the children are given a, a, a start that uplifts them and empowers them, then our future is great. Right. And there's been a very <laughs> little effort on the part of the world to emphasize a pregnant woman is one of the, you know, is the most contributing factor to the future. And if people would, you know, if she lives in a harmonious, loving, happy environment, that child is going to be a benefit to our society. But if that woman is, you know, stressed and trying to support herself, living on the edge and all this kind of stuff, I say, this child, uh, from its experiences through the mother, is not going to be a great benefit to our civilization. So the most important factor, and people just don't get it, is pre and perinatal experiences are the fundamental uh, insight as to what the future is all about. And it's God, I mean, it's just hard for me as a biologist to go out there and say, you know, you aren't taking care of the future. You're not taking care of those women that are pregnant and supporting that child in its earliest development because that is our future. And, and I'm honored because my friend Thomas over here, it was a guy who understood that <laughs> long pioneer, Thomas Pioneer. And I, I had, was there in the if beginning. I had my way, if I had my way, I would like every pregnant woman to wear a t-shirt which says baby under construction. That's it. People, you know, when I was teaching in school and somewhat similar ideas still here, and I was teaching this 40 years ago, was, oh, what, what does a you know, pregnant woman need to do? And they say, well, she needs to eat well, take vitamins and supplements and needs to exercise. Right. I go, that's all you, that, that's what we taught in medical school. I was in a medical school teaching yeah. this stuff. I go, yeah. that's all it takes to make a, you know, a happy baby or something like that. And it's like, uh oh, <laughs> big problem because it turns out they didn't understand epigenetics. And I say, what's the significance? I say, the blood of our bodies has the chemistry that matches the picture. And I say, yeah, but the blood of our body goes to the fetus in the, in the womb. So I go, why is that important? Well, if the mother's emotionally stressed, then the stress chemicals in her blood are traveling to the womb 
and are influencing the development of the child, influencing the genetics. I go, oh my God, people don't get it. Mothers are genetic engineers. Right. They're shaping the genetic activity of their child by their experiences during the development of that child. Right. And if they're not supported and they're stressed and the child's coming out in a posture of protection <laughs> versus if a child is happy when it's born, it's open to the world, take it in, help create love. That's what a child comes with until we put fear into that child. And I say, fear, I said, the child doesn't know fear. And I go, the chemistry of fear is what the fetus experiences. May not know the details of why the fear, but it sure as hell knows uh, a, a happy mother or a mother uh, in, in fear because the chemistry that goes to that baby is different and the chemistry controls genetic activity. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I said, you just people don't understand that you just don't have a baby and go to work and forget, you know, like this little babies. When, when we were teaching this years ago, Thomas, so why it was, oh, just eat well, vitamins, supplements, exercises, because that time genes control the baby's experience. And all the mother has to do is nourish the baby and the genes take care of the rest. Old false belief, because epigenetics has environment of the cells controls the genes and the environment is the mother's blood and whatever her fears or anxieties or anger, that's chemistry that she, we all can experience those things, chemistry. Well, that goes to the fetus and that chemistry is an environment, the epigenetic control. And so it is so damn profoundly important and so given little insight to, to, uh, um, to parents about, this, you, you, as you said, future under construction here, uh, and and parents don't get this, uh, and it upsets me a lot because it's not the parents' fault; it's the environment that's teaching the parents. You know, and one of oh my God, there's so many things here, Thomas, that are so critical to the development of a child, because look, in this time of pandemics, epidemics, and all that other stuff going on in here, you have to recognize a child's immune system isn't functionally equivalent to you know working until two, three years of age when it's really engaged. Mm -hmm. I says, yeah, but wh what does the baby require if the immune system's not working? I go, well, when it's in utero, the mother's immune system antibodies are going through the baby. Right. So when the baby's born, it already has some antibodies, but they don't last forever kind of thing. Right. Right. I say, well, what is the baby gonna do between now and the time the immune system kicks in? I go, mother's milk contains all the antibodies that that baby needs to protect itself in the environment because the mother has already experienced those things and created this protection device. And the only way you can get them is mother's milk, which just want to tell you right now, the lipids in mother's milk are the most powerful lipids on the planet. And I go, well, what the hell do I want powerful lipids for? And I go, the brain is white for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's mainly fat. <laughs> it's mainly right. lipids. Right. And the first organ to grow to maturity is the brain. Right. And it has again, I said, well, damn well, it's got to have some great lipids because that's the building blocks of the brain. I go, oh, formula? Holy crap. That's a pharmaceutical put on. And it's the most uh, terrible thing for the future of our evolution. Why? It doesn't have the lipids, first of all, so the brain development is impaired. That's number one. Number two, it has zero antibodies in it. Right. And it has no protective value for that child. Right. You want to protect a child? The mother carries the antibodies in her milk. And, and so I get, obviously, you see me getting a little emotional here, Thomas, is because people never get the profound significance of child development in regard to the future of our world. And we're just not investing mm -hmm. and in, in even informing the public of the powerful role that this period of pre and perinatal life is to the rest of our world, because whoever new babies are coming in, they're the future of our civilization. We don't give them a good start. I don't want to see what's going to happen from that consequence right there. So, um, Thomas, uh, I'm sitting here just saying, this guy was very instrumental in my life, one, because he, he gave me a whole new meaning for the work that I was doing in epigenetics.
because it, uh, when first it was just like, oh, our consciousness affects our genes. Mm -hmm. But through Thomas's work, I realized our consciousness, our consciousness is affecting the future of civilization. <laughs> and nobody emphasizes that. Where's that future? I said, the kids. And if you don't give them the right program, you disempower them. And that's why most people feel they're victims. Oh, genes control my life. I'm a victim. I say, well, the picture of victim is translated into victim. Mm -hmm. uh, and we become what we think. And it's interesting because I just gave a lecture the other day and I used a, um, an illustration of nuns in, in Tibet. Uh, uh, and the Buddha said, what we think we become. Yes. 2,500 years ago, mm -hmm. he understood the whole bottom line. Mm -hmm. What we think we become. We become. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and not w until it was interpreted to the, our world by Thomas, did anybody ever put those pieces together in regard to, what about the child? <laughs> what about the baby? Where's that thinking coming from? And it's like, uh-oh, we left that part out of medical school. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what is, what is your understanding or definition, if you like, of consciousness? I always struggle with that word. What, what do you mean by consciousness? Well, this is a, a beautiful question, Thomas, because about we can give 20 different levels of I the know. definition What's here. Yours? You know, oh, we can talk about human consciousness. Yeah. Oh, we can write five pages on that. And I say, yeah, but consciousness at its most basic fundamental understanding yeah. is awareness of the environment. Mm -hmm. and, and I go, so I say, so what? And I say, well, as a biologist, uh, a wonderful biologist who had passed on, Lynn Margulis, uh, revealed bacteria of course have consciousness they read what's going on in their environment and adjust their biology to what's going on in the environment so by definition they're reading the environment and responding to the environment i say so yeah bacteria are conscious and i go well how's that relate to human consciousness i said well that's really primitive consciousness right. and evolution which is in my book spontaneous evolution is measured by the development of the brain not by genetics that, 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 that's a Darwin theory. Oh, yes, as you grow up the evolutionary tree, there's more and more and more genes. I go, well, the Human Genome Project pulled the plug on that one because it turns out we expected to find over 100,000 genes to make a complex human. And it turns out the Human Pro Genome Project revealed about 20,000 genes. I go, 20,000 genes? I go, some of the most primitive organisms on this planet and one that I work with in a lab, Cenorhabditis elegans, a worm. It only has 1,250 cells. It's a little tiny thing like this. 20,000 genes. I go, wait, the worm's got 20,000. The human's got 20,000. And I don't think I can measure evolution by measuring genes because that was the wrong thing. Right. What we measure evolution by is consciousness. Uh -huh. That's the point. And, and, and when we start looking at that, then we have a different understanding of the role of consciousness, which you know Thomas brings into, hey, you're not being conscious about this baby, are you? Well, time to wake up, folks. Uh, uh, but consciousness starts at a primitive level and evolves to a human level. And it wasn't genes that were the primary driver of this force, okay? It was environment. Uh, 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 and the idea is we, can, we are, you know, <laughs> down dumbing environment people. We're, environment, we're making them dumb because we're telling them they're victims. Oh, you need us, you need the drugs, you need all this stuff. And as soon as you need comes in, everybody goes, oh, I gotta get that. <laughs> they go, you don't need any of that stuff. So you, you don't even understand how powerful you right. are. Yeah. Because you're a creator. Yeah. That's, uh, and this is the hard part because when you understand the nature of we're creators yeah. and then you start talking to people, I wanna tell you what some people go and they go, no, don't tell me I'm a creator. I don't want to be responsible for all that stuff that happened back there. And I go, until you're responsible, you can't change all that stuff how back you, there. How do, you, how do you explain the fact that there are so many people who are unconscious? There are so many people who are not at all aware of their own feelings or the feelings of others or even what's going on in the world. Like they're going... They're sleepwalking through life. They are uh, absolutely they are what just what sleepwalking to, is. Yeah, so, what sleepwalking. Happened, what what's that, Thomas? To those people. Why are they like that? <laughs> 
Well, there are two factors that contribute to that. So let's get into factor number one, which affects okay. all of us. And that is simply this. When we say the mind, it gives an image of a single entity, the mind. I go, no, there are two minds. They have two different functions. And most importantly, they learn in different ways. And I go, so what are the two minds? I say, well, the original mind is called the subconscious mind. I go, what does that mean? Sub, below, conscious behaviors that you don't have to think about heart rate, digesting your food, breathing. You don't have to think about all these things. And anything that we put into subconscious mind is a habit. That's it's called the habit mind. Okay. Now, a lot of people think, oh, the subconscious, that's the evil mind. I go, look, the subconscious is a hard drive in a brain computer. I go, significance, is the hard drive in your computer evil? I go, no, it's not. It's the programs can be evil, but don't blame the hard drive. Mm -hmm. Because for example, when did we learn how to walk? before we were two. Right. And I go, how long are you gonna walk with that program? I said, you could be 102, you're still using the same damn program you got when you were two. So when a habit gets in there, <laughs> that baby wants to stay because uh -huh. the word habit means it's not gonna change. Right. And so habits become problematic. I said, when do we get habits? And as Thomas's work drew very clear lines, said we start getting habits even before we're born. And I say, how we respond to the environment, consciousness, we become conscious. There are signals in the environment, they make us feel certain ways and we respond in certain ways. And as Thomas is quite aware is if we're sending information to a child, then the kind of information that is healthy and beneficial is love, uh, you know, safety, that's a big one, love, safety, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, being part. I mean, a child is born seeking this love. It comes with love. Yes. And, and then somehow or other, we program that out of them at some point. So I say, okay, I have to get programs in my mind. Let's summarize that very quickly. Why should I have programming for the first seven years? That's when the brain is in a state mainly of hypnosis, theta, a brain right. vibration. Right. I go, how many rules must a child learn to be a member of a family? And to be a functional member of a community. I said, if you wrote those rules in a book, it'd be you know, a giant book of how you behave here, how you behave there, what you do, blah, blah, blah. I go, how's a child gonna learn these rules to become part of the family? I say, nature made it simple. I said, first seven years, download just by observing. Watch your mother, watch your father, watch your kids, or your community. And in the first seven years, what you see is behavior you're downloading. So the programs that are in their subconscious mind basically didn't even come from us. They came from observing other people. But that gets a kid off the ground. So by age seven, now they can think, use the conscious mind and can become created. And then I say, now here comes part two of the problem. The conscious mind, yes, that's the one with wishes and desires of imagination, creativity. That's a fabulous one. But I go, interestingly though, that mind also uh, uh, can think. I said, what the hell does that mean? I go, a thought is inside the head. I go, so wait, my conscious mind's like driving, consider the body as a vehicle for a moment with a steering wheel here, okay? And the conscious mind's looking out the window, going to where? Wherever the hell it wants to go, creative mind, go anywhere it wants. I say, but if the conscious mind is thinking, now it's not looking out the window because a thought is looking inside. I go, wait a minute, the moment you're thinking, your conscious mind's not looking out anymore. I go, no. So, hey, what if I'm driving the car down the interstate and I'm going 70 miles an hour and I have a thought, my conscious mind's not going to look out the window? I go, no. <laughs> I go, well, but I do it and I'm still here. And I go, yeah, because the subconscious mind, which is a million times more powerful a computer, will step in as autopilot when you are thinking and take over. Mm -hmm. So I go, so wait, what's the difference? I go, well, when the conscious mind is running the system, that's creative, wishes and desires. Mm -hmm. When the subconscious mind takes over as autopilot, it just plays the programs. I go, where'd the programs come from? Other people. I go, so why is that important? Because 95% of the day is what the average person spends thinking. I go, so what does that mean? And I go, mathematically? You're only controlling your life 5% of the day. 95% is coming from the program. And biggest, biggest problem here, Thomas, biggest problem. Well, why are you playing the program? Because the conscious mind's not looking out. It's looking in, thinking, what am I doing? Where am I going? Where have I been? What's what, blah, 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 thinking, thinking. Yeah. I go, so what? And I go, but if it's inside thinking, it's not looking out. I go, yeah. And I say, yeah, but if the program that's playing is controlling your life, 
and your thinking, then you don't even see your own behavior. No, because uh, the ta- it's just taken over by the program. So it's not your life. And you're the only one that can't see it. Uh, Thomas, 40 years, I even probably said that in a lecture when, when I first met you, uh, a story that people in the audience get. I go, you have a friend and you know your friend's behavior very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. Uh, one day you see your friend has the exact same behavior as the parent. So, you know, you got, you got to say, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. Because I know exactly what Bill's going to say. Is, How can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. The audience laughs. Why? Everyone has had these experiences. And I go, most profound story in the world. And I go, what do you mean? I go, everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. Bill's the only one that can't see it. I say, where'd he get the behavior? He downloaded his dad's behavior before age seven. He's playing it. Why? Because he's thinking. And when he's thinking, whatever behavior is coming out, he can't see. So everybody else can see Bill behaves like his dad, except for Bill. And then here comes the conclusion that I, we are all Bill. Every one of us is doing this every day. And all we understand is, Geez, I started this morning to become healthy and successful and find love. And I came home this evening. Guess what? None of it happened. And I said, then what happened? And then you would say, well, this person did that. And this person did this. And they all interfered. And I go, not once during the day did you see you were playing a program that sabotaged you. And you're the only one that didn't see it. And it's a wake up call. And the wake up call is we're not living the life we want we're living the life we were programmed to have and we're the only ones that don't see the damn program so we find ourselves back in the story of victim oh i'm a victim of my this i'm a victim of my genes i'm a victim 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 i go never were you a victim you were always the master but no one showed you so until that uh, light comes into that dark face there people are going to stay victims until they understand no, you, you're just playing programs. <laughs> you're not even living the life you want. Uh, and, and so just to help, because this all of a sudden now becomes a critical part, Thomas, as you well know, we were programmed before we were conscious. So, and we were programmed even before we were born, last trimester of pregnancy. So I, I asked the audience, I go, hey, so what program did you get while you were in utero? Uh, I don't know. Okay, what program you were programmed a whole year from zero to one? Tell me a program. Uh, I don't know. Okay, you were a program a whole year from one to two. What was the program? Uh, I don't know. And I say you were programmed from two to three. And by three, you might even remember some of these programs because consciousness is kicking in a little bit. But I say for the first three years, you don't even know what the hell your programs are. Why? Because you were not conscious when the programs came in and the conscious mind did not filter the programs that you downloaded, like good program, bad program. Uh Uh-uh. All programs got downloaded. Okay, now you're stuck here in this world. And I say, you're like Bill, I'm like Bill, we're playing these programs. I say, but how do I know what the programs are? So a little simple insight, you ready? Ready. The things that you like that come into your life, they come in because you have programs to acknowledge those things. But the things you wish for, desire, want, and you work hard, and you put effort into it, and you're going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm sweating over it. I'm working real hard. Why are you working so hard? And the answer inevitably is whatever that destination is, your program doesn't support it, and you're trying to override the program with effort. And I say, it doesn't work very well at all. It's very hard. So I just say, look at your life and just recognize this. The things you like to come in, don't worry about them. you got programs. That's why they're there. But the things that you aspire to, and you have trouble getting there. It's not because you can't have those things. It's because your program does not support that. (laughs) And you're trying to override this program with this little tiny conscious mind back here versus the 95% of subconscious back here. It's a little difficult to do that. Are you saying that everything that you find difficult, you shouldn't do? Uh, Everything I find difficult is what, Thomas? You should not engage in because it's an old program no 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 what you should what you should do is say can i change the program oh my god oh my god can i change the program i go thomas this would be a very sad affair 
if I had to sit up here and say, forget about it, you can't do anything about it, that's your life, go home. I said, no way. <laughs> the idea is you have to understand, A, you have a program because most people don't even see that. Uh, you know, uh, and it's uh, just for most people who have seen the movie, The Matrix. Yes. It's not science fiction. The movie, The Matrix is a documentary. I go, what do you mean? It starts with a premise. Everybody got programmed. I go, well, that's absolutely 100% true. No question there. And, th and then they talk about, well, if you take a red pill, you can get out of the program. And I go, and most of our audience, Thomas, has taken a red pill. And now if I refresh their memory of that, maybe they'll see what the consequence was. And I say, maybe each one of you at some point had fallen deeply in love. Uh -huh. I go, so what? And I say, your life changed in 24 hours. Whatever your life, blah, 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 blah. You fell in love 24 hours later. Oh, life is so beautiful. I'm so in love. The food's great. The music's great. Even, even the job is crummy, but not bad. Who cares? I'm in love. Science has recognized that when you fall in love, you stop thinking, you stay present, you stay mindful, which is very logical. If you've been looking for this person your whole life, why would you spend time thinking and not being there when they're here? So biologically, it turns out when you fall in love, you stay mindful, you stay present, which means you stop playing the program. So I what say, happens, what's the consequence? Just what 24 happens? hours later, your blah, blah, blah turns to heaven and earth. I go, that is the red pill, folks. So what happens? And unfortunately, when you fall it wears off of for most people. What happens when you? Well, fall you didn't out fall out of love. What happened? What, what happens is this. Remember, two minds: conscious, creative mind, wishes, desires, the honeymoon, the thing that you love, planet Earth, love, everything. Subconscious mind, programs, not even from you, from other people. So I say, when you meet somebody, guess what? You stop playing the programs. You are now living from conscious creativity, wishes and desires, conscious mind. I go, great. So I say that whole relationship, did you play the program? I say, no. Why? I was being creative. I created the love and everything that I have. I, we were honeymoon. I go, great. Then I say, what happens? I go, how did you create the honeymoon? Oh, you stopped playing the program? I say, why were you playing programs? Because you were thinking. And I go, at some point, even in the honeymoon, you have to start thinking. I got a job, I got responsibilities, I got to take care of it. The moment you start thinking, yes. the next behavior that comes out of you yes. is not coming from the heaven on earth creative mind, it's coming from the program that you didn't even play during the entire honeymoon. And all of a sudden, your partner begins to see a side of you you didn't even show before because you were being mindful. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, now you're playing these negative programs and your partner looks at you. I love the line that this is one of the cool ones. Ready? Who are you? That's a response to where the hell did that program come from? Where did that behavior come from? In a relationship where that behavior did not play during the honeymoon because we didn't play programs. But once they start showing up, they put a damper on the system. And the worse those programs are, the more the damper is on the system to the extent 50% of marriages fall apart. Why? Because the person they married, the conscious mind person, gives way to the subconscious program person, which is totally different. And all of a sudden, what held the marriage together is gone because we're not operating from the wishes and desires. We start operating from those programs. Apparently, about 60% of the programs we downloaded are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. So that means 60% of your behavior is sabotaging you and you're the only one that doesn't see it until your partner says i'm leaving mm -hmm. why <laughs> <laughs> uh, why yes <laughs> that's a good one so um on, on a more personal level what do you think in your in your background sort of prepared you or or sort of motivated you to get into this kind of work yeah um in my family, uh, my parents had a dysfunctional relationship, yeah. which, of course, as we talked about in pre and perinatal programming, led to me uh, having behaviors that were the same as my dysfunctional father. <laughs> uh, uh, and this was quite problematic, of course, because <laughs> most of my life was coming from those programs, except that one of the good programs that I got in our family was education, mm -hmm. that to make it in this world, intelligence was an important part of the program. 
and my parents really supported anything in education. Uh, so if I said, oh, I, I, I saw things in a microscope, I'd love to have a microscope, they'd buy yes. me a microscope, okay? Uh -huh. They didn't buy me a lot of toys. Yeah. They bought me things that would enhance my my work. So mm -hmm. I was grounded in in the professionalism of, of education and science. Yes. And that made me very successful as a basic program. And it led to university professorship, professor in a medical school, all that kind of stuff. But I have to admit then for the first 50 years, man, my personal life was, uh, you know, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it's like, like I leave wreckage behind <laughs> wherever I was. Uh, and, and that changed me. So there's two parts of me. There's the professional part, man, my science was great. I loved it. That was the best thing in the whole world. I, it wasn't even work. I mean, being, you know, doing research in a lab was like, mm -hmm going into outer space, but going into inner space in the case of cells. Right. Uh, uh, I love that stuff. But on a personal level, uh, you know, my behavior, which was programmed by my parents, was uh, totally dysfunctional until nearly 50 years of age, at which time I really learned how to change my programming. Uh, and and, the, and the, the, the secret sauce here, Thomas, as you well know, is what if you rewrote the negative programs and turn them into all positive programs. And then guess what? Then you'd be living heaven on earth, not just 5% of the time when your creative conscious mind is working, you'd be living heaven on earth 95% of the time just from the programs in the subconscious. So I rewrote those programs and end up with my partner, Margaret, uh, and then spending the last 26, seven years uh, in a honeymoon perpetual because I start, it, what broke the honeymoon? The return back to the program. But in my case, if I went back to my program, I had a new program, which was all my wishes and desires. So whether I was using my conscious mind manifesting wishes and desires, or my subconscious mind, 95% of the time was creating behaviors that manifest wishes and desires, and it was 100% of time living on this planet for the last 26, seven years of I live heaven on earth every day of my life. Uh, and the reality is why? Because I changed the programs <laughs> uh, and I can do it automatically. I'm living heaven on earth without even thinking about living heaven on earth because it's automatic at this point. Well, and that's the, the that's yeah. secret sauce. As the old saying goes, it takes two to tango. So if you only were the one who is conscious and your partner was not, would that still work? No, because now you're on different dialogues, you know, and then that's when one wants to be the teacher for the other. I said, don't do that. <laughs> don't so, be, let me show you how to be a better partner. It's like, no, don't even go there, folks. So how, how did you, how <laughs> it doesn't did work you, that way. <laughs> how did you, uh, because how both did you, people have to understand. That's why I was fortunate enough that when I met Margaret, her previous career was uh, running a, a major workshop training program company called Summit. They had like 140 people working for them to set up these you know, hmm. programs, training, workshops. So when we got both into the relationship, both of us were aware that we both have programs that if they manifest, it's not us. If they manifest, mm -hmm. it's when we're, we're playing it unconsciously, which then instead of leading to an argument, because if you don't understand this and somebody goes, blah, 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 and the other one goes, oh, and then the next thing is this argument. What if both people understood that that behavior that just came out wasn't really me because they know me from the experience, then all of a sudden there's no argument, there's a discussion. Do you want this behavior? Is that satisfying? And all of a sudden at a point you say, no. Well, then we change the behavior. And every time one that came up that was you know, not nice in the, in the, in the harmony, we would rewrite it. And the result is what? We, we're together 100% of the time, whether we're in the same room or other side of the world, we're, our consciousness, our spirituality, which is something I recognized after 40 or plus years in the science business, not being spiritual, awakening to, oh my God, I'm not in here. And it was the understanding that each of us is receiving a broadcast from the field and no two people receive the same broadcast. And I go, it's expressed as why we can't exchange parts with each other, like lungs and you know kidneys and stuff without going through some extreme measures because each of us has a different identity. 
And this is what led me to it. And I say, well, wait, what do you mean we have a different identity? I say, well, if I put my cells into Thomas, uh, his immune system will say not self and get rid of it. If he put his cells or organs into me, my immune system will say not self, get rid of it. And I go, well, obviously the immune system can recognize self from not self. I go, well, then there's something it's looking at. And that led me to the understanding on the surface of our cells are these proteins like television antennas. And there's a set of them called self receptors. I go, self receivers. I go, yes. And until we understood the nature of quantum physics, I thought chemistry was controlling those receptors. It's like, no, energy vibration is controlling those receptors. I go, so what's the point? If I take my self receptors off my cells, my cells would be generic. I have liver cell, you have a liver cell, we all got the same cells. It wouldn't be Bruce's liver cell anymore. And if I took Margaret's self receptors off of her cell and put it onto my cell, then it becomes Margaret's cell. I transferred ownership of identity by these receptors. And then the step back was when I understood the nature of quantum physics, where everything was energy, I started to realize, oh my God, they're just like TV antennas. They're picking up a, a, a broadcast. <laughs> and, and, and so, and that broadcast is playing through us. So my simple analogy is that here's Bruce, the television set. I go, well, where's the broadcast? I said, it's coming in from out here, being picked up by these antennas on my cell. So I say, this is the part that just blew my mind. There were a couple of things that the moment this happened, it's like in my science mind, I said, wait a minute. And the body's like a television. I go, yeah. I say, well, when you're watching a TV and TV breaks, you say, TV is dead. And I go, yes, it is. Uh, but the big question was, is the broadcast still there? Of course it's still there. Get another TV, plug it in, turn it on, and you're back on with a different TV. And I go, jeez. Oh, <laughs> we are broadcasts playing through a body. And that the body is not who we are. Mm -hmm. So if I... My television goes, my broadcast still there, but another body ends up with the same antennas. I'm back, but in a different body. Well, does it make a difference, male or female? I go, nope, that's a TV set. Does it make a difference, white, brown, black, red, yellow? I go, no, that's a TV set. We're not the TV set, we're the broadcast. And all of a sudden I said, oh my God. A, I can't die, I'm not in here, which blew me away because you don't realize, and this is unconscious, subconscious, learned from the beginning, the fear of death. Only humans know they're going to die. No other animal knows it's going to die. And I say it carries a lot of baggage with that knowledge because now fear of death comes in. And once fear of death comes in, then guess what? Whose story do you want to buy about what happens when you die? <laughs> well, there are all these religions are all over the world. They're going to tell you what's going to happen. I go, hey, I'm a spiritual person. Why? Because I'm the broadcast. <laughs> I'm not this. And the, and, the, and the broadcast is always there. And, and then comes a very interesting part because I'm the science guy. I didn't believe in spirituality. I'm looking at these proteins and God, oh, my mind's going oh my god uh, i'm receiving a broadcast of bruce through these things uh, and and all of a sudden uh, and i love this because i laughed because i said to myself then why have a body why not just be a spirit mm -hmm. and 50 trillion cells in my body welled up with the answer that came to my head the cells answered me with a question. I didn't know I had Jewish comedian cells. I asked a question, why I have a body and a spirit? 50 trillion cells asked me this question, most profound question in the world that I ever heard. You ready? Yes. Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? You gotta think about that one for a moment, folks. Okay. Because all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, this is a mechanism, eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch, yeah. feelings, love, pain, anger. Yeah. This is chemistry translated by the brain into vibration sent back to source. Yes. So when we come in with a vision, we're, we're living, trying to create the vision and whatever's happening, our thoughts are not contained in our head. People think when they put wires on a person's head, electroencephalograph, I'm reading your thoughts inside your head. I go, that's what we believe. There's a new device called magnetoencephalograph. It reads brain function too, but guess what? 
the probe is out here. And I go, oh my God, you have to understand, if I can read your brain function out here, your thoughts are not contained in your head. They're broadcast into the field and they can go back to source karma. <laughs> I alter my source by my life experience because my send back the broadcast. But it's also creative because whatever energy we send out in the field, there was an important quote from physics. I'll, I'll just put a little box why this quote is so important, okay? Albert Einstein quote, the field, the invisible energy around us, the field is the sole governing agency of matter. Mm. And all of a sudden, like, oh my God, this is what quantum physics has said since 1927. Consciousness, a field of energy is manifesting our life experience. Mm -hmm. And Thomas, you caught that so long ago. That's what led to pre and perinatal psychology. The experience from that field <laughs> is programming at this point. Uh, and this really became critical to me because all of a sudden I said, oh, A, I can't die, which took a lot of pressure off. <laughs> you don't realize how much of your unconscious processing is looking for mm -hmm. threatening things in your world. Mm -hmm. You walk down the street, mm -hmm. the mind just looking at everything. Guess what? Mm -hmm. It notices that's a scary place or this person doesn't, mm -hmm. that person looks scary or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it looks for where you should be afraid to protect yourself, it's, it's called the biological imperative. I go, what if you walk down the street and you didn't care? I go, then all that brain function was not working anymore. I go, and what about that? And I go, you don't realize how much energy we put into the subconscious program to stay alive every day. Mm -hmm. And if you would let go of that program, guess what? All of a sudden this energy goes, let's use this energy for good stuff. <laughs> And that's where I transformed my life. It's like, I don't have to be afraid anymore. I lost the fear. Do I need it through religion? No, personally, no. Do I need it through spirituality? Personally, yes. Why? If you understand your identity as an energy field, then all of a sudden you realize you, you're not this, you're the field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 and that means you can come back and do it again <laughs> and maybe do it better the next time. That's why the karma, come back, you better fix it up because you blew the vibration last time. <laughs> now, maybe you should come back and live a different vibration so that you can bring it back to harmony. Karma, it's been around for thousands of years. We just didn't understand it till quantum physics. So do you believe in some sort of afterlife? Oh, 100 <laughs> percent. Not even believing it. It's like, my God, it, it's physics. I, it, it, we're an energy field. We're all energy. The, the illusion is matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a damn, uh, you know, <laughs> Albert Einstein said, uh, yeah, uh, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. <laughs> uh, uh, and what he was trying to say is this. What we perceive as matter, you, me, look, we're both in rooms and environments. We're all over, oh, touch, oh, look, physical. I go like that. That's an illusion because everything is energy. And there are explanations to how you can see it and how it responds. But the fact is this, everything is energy. And we're an energy body. That's why the new scans like CAT scan, MRI scans, they read through the body. They're not using light. Mm -hmm. They're seeing the structure of the body only in electromagnetic fields. Mm -hmm. That's what they see. They don't see physical things. And all of a sudden you realize, well, my God, every structure in the body has its own electromagnetic field. I go, yeah, that's, that's what gives us a, you know, this, this mechanism that we have. But so, so I let truly- me, Let me ask you, let me ask you one question. <clears throat> yeah. What does, what does being human mean to you? The bottom line of being human on this planet means to me is this, and, uh, and it's profound for me, okay? And that is this. A lot of people perceive that uh, when you die, you get a chance to go to the heaven. Yes. Not here, yes. over there somewhere. Right. You get, it's how, there. The, how you live here depends yeah. on that. Yeah. My research reveals a completely different insight, and it says you were born into heaven. Why? Because you came here to manifest. And to manifest, we need this physical body. And therefore, we are creating our life and experiencing our life through this physical body. What does chocolate taste like? You better ask the body because consciousness can't translate that, you know? Uh, and so basically, it really came down to my belief, and I hold on to this as strong as anything. 
don't wait to die before you go to heaven. You were born into heaven. <laughs> this is where you came to create. And then you go, but I wouldn't want to create that. And I go, but you didn't. Your program created that. <laughs> Change the program and the creation changes right in your face like this. This is what the whole idea is. So what do you see as sort of your calling in life? What is it that you want to achieve? I want the people to awaken to their own personal power because I trust the people versus the so-called leadership. Because in general, all people around the world want the exact same thing. They want peace and safety, uh, uh, you know, a home, a job, a uh, community, Almost everybody wants the same thing. Yes, right. And the right. evolution that we have to understand is we're all cells. You, me, everybody. We're right. cells in a bigger organism called humanity. And right now, you the structure of humanity is affected by what I teach. It's called autoimmune disease. I go, what's autoimmune disease? That means self-destructive disease. I go, yes, civilization is facing its autoimmune disease right now, not just on the outside, but on the inside. Most of the illness on this planet has nothing to do with, less than 1% of illness has anything to do with genes. Less than 1% of our life is influenced by those genes in regard to health. Then I said, well then, where's our life coming from? I said, the consciousness part, not from the genes. <laughs> and I said, well, then where's ill health coming from? The consciousness part, not from the genes. Uh, and all of a sudden it says, if we understood something which is not taught, a matter of fact, people take it away, personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because everyone feels they're a victim. And as a victim, I'm not responsible. They did it, they did it, they did it. And I go, no, nope. until you understand you're the creator, mm -hmm. then you're a victim. <laughs> And when you understand you're a creator, and I then say, how do you get from victim to creator? And I say, well, you can start reading by t reading Thomas Verney's book, because where did you lose your creatorship? <laughs> in the programming that disempowered you in your development. And if you ever got that programming back or on the right track, then I can assure you something I never believed in for over 40 years is, man, when you really understand the nature of love, not just of a partner, but love of my God, just being alive, then you understand the nature of heaven on earth. And until we're living heaven on earth, there's a struggle going on here, but that struggle has nothing to do with who we are, it just has that struggle has everything to do with who we were been programmed to be. We've been disempowered, so others have power over us. And those programs start early, they start early. Listen, the Jesuits, for 400 years, told their followers the truth and nobody grabbed it. I said, what did they say? They said, give me a child until it is seven and I will show you the man. Right. They knew law 400 years ago, what I only learned in this little lifetime right here. Right. And that is that first seven years is programming and 95% of the rest of your life comes from the program. And that's exactly what they said. Give me the child for seven yep. and I'll show you the man, meaning if I get the program in them by seven, then I control the rest of their life. And I go, that's not a new idea, folks. That's been here for 400 years. And I say, you want to see programming today? Much better than Jesuits. They created Catholic school, mm -hmm. programmed everybody to be Catholics there, you know. Mm -hmm. But today, when you see an infant, a toddler that can barely walk carrying an iPad, mm -hmm. that's programming, my that's friend. Programming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bruce, thank you so much. We have to stop at that point. Uh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been an incredible discussion. Uh, I had Dr. Bruce Lipton as my guest today. Uh, his book, The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Consciousness Matter and Miracles is a fantastic book. Uh, definitely recommended reading as are all his other books. And uh, all I can say is uh, thank you, Bruce. It's so good to know you and to know of you and to be friends with you. So thank you for being here. 
and uh, friends. Th Thomas, I would like to offer something right yes. here myself. I want to thank you for many different reasons. Primarily, look, on the track I'm at, I left Stanford going, where am I going? And you dropped me into the pre and perinatal world in psychology and, and genetics and epigenetics. That was fabulous. Also, uh, it was at the first meeting where I met you. I also met Margaret, which now uh, the, the Honeymoon Effect book is all about how we created this. And more importantly, Thomas, I really want to thank our audience because our audience are those people that are cultural creatives. They're looking for, give me an answer that's not in the box because the answers in the box are creating the problem. <laughs> the only way we're going to get out of it is get outside the box and, and create something new. That, I think that was Buckminster Fuller's uh, futurist view. He said, don't try and change the system. Step outside, create your own system, and then people will come out there. Mm. Uh, and I firmly believe that. And therefore, I appreciate our audience because these are the people looking for different answers. And I appreciate you, Thomas, as being uh, an elder in our world of uh, bringing some principles in that are so fundamental for the survival of life on this planet. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, you know, you are one of my best and closest friends, and it's just such a treasure to have you in my life. Thank you. And uh, all my best to Margaret. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.